Thank you very much. Thank you for this very warm welcome and kind words. Uh, Dr. Obedi said that if any of you want to leave during the talk, use the back doors. And I was wondering whether that applies to me as well. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate uh, this opportunity. And it's very important for me to address people across this beautiful country directly. We have our job to do in Washington. We deal with the American government through the official diplomatic channels. And we also deal through the media. But that's not enough. It's very important to go to different parts of the country where we, we take the opportunity to speak to people directly and take questions from people directly. This establish, establishes a level of connection that is uh, much more effective and much more immediate. Let me thank my hosts for organizing this so uh, uh, very well. Uh, from the moment I left Washington until this moment, and I hope until I get back, everything went through like clockwork. Uh, it's been uh, a privilege to meet uh, the people I met over lunch, and I look forward in the future to continued uh, contact, hopefully through promoting the school and sending Iraqi students to study here in the future. This is a time of big issues in this country. The government and the people of the United States have a lot before them. They are looking at the financial uh, crisis, which is and, and the situation in the economy, which require great attention. They are looking at uh, health reform. That's a big issue. That really is obvious that. Uh, there's something which needs to be done, and there's a huge debate about it, and Congress is focusing on it and spending a lot of time. There's the war in Afghanistan, and threats uh, uh, from Al-Qaeda in different places, including Pakistan. There is Iran and its nuclear ambitions, uh, real or imagined, but it is a challenge. There's the Middle East conflict which, is, which needs to be addressed and it's festering. And there is Iraq. But Iraq has receded in terms of uh, its perception as a crisis. Should it be forgotten and relegated to the back burner or to a shelf in a back room, or should we still worry about it? I will argue that we should not relegate it to, the, to a shelf in, the, in a back room. I, th I, I will argue that it, it is central to American national interest, and it must not be allowed to be forgotten. But before I elaborate on that, let me step back. Step back in history. Iraq, as Dr. Abedi said, is the cradle of civilization. It's a place where the first known organized government was formed. The first ever written laws were written. Indeed, writing itself was invented there, and most people believe that the wheel was invented in that land. There are so many firsts that it would take me a long time to enumerate them, but they include the first school, the first library, and the first time beer was brewed, brewed for, or for those of you who like beer. <laughs> but I can go on, but that's not the point. The point is that Iraq was a sophisticated society. It organized itself along, along forms that were efficient, were allowed 
uh, which allowed their citizens, its citizens, to function, produce, and thrive. The concept of a week as a unit of time originated in Mesopotamia. The idea that people can work for six days and need a day for rest. That was long before um, religions enshrined that. Uh, and uh, therefore, a lot of things that we take for granted in our daily lives, I just mentioned the week, for example, and beer. These, these things, without us knowing, actually originated in my country. So it has bequeathed the entire human civilization with quite a lot. But since that time, it has not consistently been a leader. During the Middle Ages, what they, what's referred to as the Middle Ages in, in, in Europe, Iraq was once more a very important place of the world. It was indeed the center of the world. Now Iraqis send their sons to be educated like myself in England and America. At that time, the aristocracy of Europe sent their kids to be educated in Baghdad. In fact, I have in the embassy a map produced of the, of the known world at that time. I'm sorry to say America was not on it. Uh, it, shows, it shows Baghdad as the center of the world. And it shows then Europe and China and Africa uh, quite clearly on the map. But Baghdad was the center. That continued until a period of dec a decline set in. The Mongols uh, arrived, and then Iraq became uh, like a football between empires. To bring it to the modern time, the Ottoman Empire crumbled at the beginning of the 20th century. The British came in, and the modern Iraq was born. And it was born and started progressing well ahead of its neighbors. Uh, in the 30s and 40s of the last century, Iraq was a pioneering country in the arts, in literature, in poetry, in uh, law, health, everything, in education, uh, in women's rights. Uh, the first uh, woman graduate in Iraq uh, graduated in 35, 1935. Uh, the first woman uh, law, uh, judge was appointed, the first woman minister, and so on. So Iraq was up and coming and was doing quite well. Then we took the wrong turning, and a military dictatorship came in, which later became an absolute dictatorship under Saddam Hussein. Uh, several wars uh, later and sanctions, uh, Iraq was completely on its knees, uh, a ruined country. Uh, just to give you uh, some indicators, when Saddam Hussein took over, took power, Iraq uh, had uh, foreign reserves to the tune of more than 35, uh, 35 billion dollars. At that time, that was a serious number. Um, when he was deposed, Iraq was in debt uh, to the extent of more than 350 billion dollars in terms of debts and obligations for reparations. The Iraqi dinar was worth 3.33 uh, American dollars when Saddam came to power. When he left, a single American dollar was equal to more than 3,000 Iraqi dinars. The economy had totally and completely collapsed. With it, all social indicators had gone down uh, to, to uh, laws that were unprecedented. Iraq one of, became one of the poorest countries, one of the countries where crime was, uh, was highest, uh, women's uh, rights were in, in regression, and so on and so forth. So we inherited from Saddam a totally destroyed country, no infrastructure hardly. The only institutions that were standing when the Americans came in were the security institutions. All other institutions had effectively collapsed, and the sanctions had a lot 
to do with this final collapse. Then the Americans came in, and I'm sorry to say that when they came in, they didn't realize what they were walking into. And for a period of time, they pursued policies that just uh, were not related to the needs of the country. They allowed law and order to disintegrate or to, to, to go out of control. There was widespread looting, of loot, uh, looting as you remember, the, even the Iraqi museum and, and uh, archaeological sites were looted, and, and, and there was a lot of lawlessness. Uh, before they started to retrieve the situation, and you can say that the last few years uh, we were trying to retrieve the situation, uh, it, there, there was a lot of damage done. Uh, they disbanded the entire police force and had to, uh, to reassemble it uh, without, without care and without vetting, uh, which caused a lot of criminals to come into the police force. And, and, and I can enumerate a whole number of uh, other mistakes which resulted in really structural problems for the new era. But after this period of, of uh, <coughs> casting about trying to find a way forward, uh, the Americans started to appreciate what was needed. And with the surge, uh, I think they started to rectify or have, at least have a chance of rectifying these errors. And this brings to mind a quotation from Winston Churchill who once said, the Americans always end up doing the right thing after exhausting the alternatives. <laughs> And they, they just about did in Iraq, uh, but at a great cost to us Iraqis and to themselves. A lot of blood had flown, uh, was lost, a lot of lives were lost. A lot of people were made disabled, uh, huge numbers of orphans and widows. Uh, the pain uh, is, is beyond imagination. Iraqis are uh, very resilient people, uh, and they, they have the spirit to go on and to, um, to do something better. I think that's just what we are doing now with much better help from our, our American friends and now allies. Um, a new political structure has been put in with some flaws, but it is something to start with. A new constitution was put in, maybe some problems with it will have to be rectified, but we have something to start with. Uh, unprecedented uh, media freedom, uh, the beginning of an open educa educational system the beginning of an open economic order. During Saddam's time, everything, every single economic activity had to be controlled by the state. Now we have uh, an open uh, philosophy uh, for, uh, for uh, free uh, enterprise and, and the private sector. In fact, it's, uh, it's telling that during this international financial crisis, the only uh, stock exchange, which was consistently going up the last few years, the last two years, has been the Iraqi uh, uh, stock exchange, which is an indicator for the future. During the darkest year, times, uh, during 2006, 2007, <coughs> uh, opinion polls showed consistently that Iraqis believe that the future will be better than the present. The conditions in Iraq are really, really tough, unbearable. Now, I look around me here and I see well-fed, well-clad people, bright faces. Uh, I'm sure all of you uh, go home, switch on the light, so it comes on, uh, open the tap, water flushes, uh, gushes, and, and, and you know everything works. You are used to it, you take it for granted. You feel safe and you take that for granted. Imagine all this does not exist. 
you don't have electricity, it's hot, you go out, you don't know whether you come back or not, food is not uh, totally uh, available all the time, but you have to duck and, duck and dive to, to get enough food to feed your fam family. In those circumstances, life becomes unbearable. You've seen some of your loved ones die, some, in some cases before you, but you still have to go on. Thus, it's very difficult to, to bring this level of understanding to people who have not experienced it. I hope you will never ever experience it or anything like it. But for you to understand what the average Iraqi feels inside him or thinks, you need to imagine it beyond what you see on television screens, beyond what you see in newspaper reports. You have to think of these individual Iraqis, perhaps think of a woman who's lost her husband, has three or four kids, had never worked before in her life, having to fend for herself and for her children. In these circumstances, it's been very tough. It still is very tough. Our politics, because of the uh, stresses and strains of previous decades, took an unfortunate sectarian turn because the, these tensions exist, the deep wounds, but still we are coming out of that. Uh, we, we, the the, the uh, irrepressible spirit of Iraqis is shining through and really proving that uh, this nation has cohesion, rejects violence, it has rejected its the, it, it's a, the only Muslim country which has actually defeated Al-Qaeda on its own territory and has proved that it is against terrorism as a form of uh, political, uh, political action. Uh, so I have a lot of optimism in the future, but it's not just silly optimism. It is optimism tempered by the realization and appreciation of the huge challenges that we face. If Iraq were an island in the Pacific, we would have solved all our problems by now. But we are surrounded by countries who want to interfere, who want to have do domination, or at least influence over our affairs. But again, I say Iraqis generally are independent-minded mind and will protect their independence. There are people who want to pull us apart. There were people talking about splitting Iraq into two, th three entities at least, Kurds, Sunnis, and Shi'is. There, there were plans like that discussed in Washington. Well, the Iraqis stood up, all of them, against these plans and demonstrated that they believe in a unified country. It's a, it's a country which has been together for millennia, and we don't see why we now should, should uh, split it apart. And in terms of Sunnis and Shi'is, one third of the families of Iraq are mixed marriages. So we have, we have some Shia towns in the Sunni areas, we have some uh, Sunni towns and Shia areas, and as I said, many, many of our families are uh, mixed, and if you have to segregate and draw a border, that border would have to go through practically every bedroom in the country. <laughs> so solutions which are dreamt up somewhere else, uh, perhaps based on some other agenda, are just not going to work. But solutions which are created between Iraqis uh, have a good chance. In terms of uh, Iraqi-American relationship, the, uh, this is a vital relationship for us now. Uh, two agreements were signed in November last year. One, the Status of Forces Agreement, SOFA, which basically uh, deals with the security relationship and provides a schedule of disengagement, a schedule according to which the Americans can withdraw their forces having helped us 
to uh, be able to defend ourselves internally uh, and externally. But there was a second agreement, equally important, and is becoming more and more important uh, with time, the strategic framework agreement. That's a, an agreement which lays, uh, lays out the relationship in the long term, cooperation on a whole range of uh, uh, fields, uh, cultural, economic, uh, political, diplomatic, and so on. We educational, and according to that agreement, the two countries are supposed to cooperate in all these uh, uh, all these fields and uh, build a closer relationship. Uh, hopefully, uh, becoming long-term partners and allies. We are now going through a very critical time because there are elections coming up in January. Uh, the whole country is moving slowly, but I believe surely, from sectarian politics towards national politics. Uh, but tensions are, are, as I said, high because our neighbors are determined, each one of them determined, to ensure an outcome uh, in these elections that will be uh, friendly to them or convenient for them. Uh, so all attention is, is focused on the next elections, political maneuvering, preparations, and so on, is, is taking uh, place. And we are not out of danger. Now let me just put the whole of this in a wider context. There is now in the world a huge struggle going on. Uh, during the 60s, 70s, and even 80s, there was the Cold War. There was a confrontation between the Western powers and communism. That ended with the defeat of communism. There is now another global struggle between the ideas of freedom, democracy, openness, and the ideas of dictatorship, closed societies, and, uh, and extremism. Al-Qaeda, Taliban, extremists in Iraq, and other parts of the world are only components in this bigger struggle. I believe that Iraq is the central front in that struggle. Iraq has always been a determining factor in its regional context. Iraq is not a small, irrelevant country. It might be a weak country. It might have a lot of disadvantages. But Iraq has, has the historic and political gravity that will impact what happens around it. And what happens in Iraq will have huge ramifications on what happens in the region and ultimately what happens in the world. If Iraq fails, it will be a huge setback in the struggle against extremism and, and terrorism in, in the world across the whole world. But if Iraq succeeds, I believe that we have a very good chance of defeating Al-Qaeda and the extremists worldwide, wherever they are. And I believe for that reason, Iraq should not be relegated and should not be forgotten and should continue to be the focus of attention despite all the distractions and despite all the other issues that need to be dealt with. Thank you very much indeed for listening to me, and I hope to take some questions from you. Thank you.